Welcome to the Commerce Tomorrow podcast. Your one stop to learn about the technology that's powering the future of commerce. Here are your hosts, Dirk and Kelly. Hello, everybody. Thanks for listening in. This is Dirk. And this is Kelly. We are having another episode recording from Shark Talk. Uh, we are at the last day and with us is a special guest. So I am happy to welcome Zia Daniel Wichter. Wichter? Yep, well pronounced. So um, Chief Content Officer of Shark Talk Ventures. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having you with us. Sure. Thank you for um, having me. Before we dive into the show and the recap, maybe yep. tell us a little bit more about you. How came it that you started Shop Talk? Yep, absolutely. Um, so I joined Shop Talk at the very beginning, prior to our official launch, and I met Anil and John when I was still working at Forrester. So I'd spent seven years at Forrester running the global omnichannel research there and was intrigued by uh, what they were describing because they had had such success with Money 2020 going with a similar formula, but in fintech and payments. Um, and so I thought that in many ways it would be similar to what I'd been doing at Forrester in that I was looking at global retail and e-commerce trends and distilling them into something that was digestible for an audience. It was just a very different end product. So instead of reports or blog posts, it was now an event. No, that's interesting. Um, and you know, it's really remarkable how Shop Talk has become the show for commerce. And uh, how, did, how did that happen? How did the show get started? And what's your recipe for success? Because I've never seen another show have this level of success where three years in, every, even two years in, everybody just said, this is it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, obviously, these guys have done it before. Um, and they very successfully scaled Money 2020 into a, um, a large event, uh, the largest fintech and payments conference in the world. So. What intrigued me was the idea of doing this for retail and e-commerce. And I think my initial reaction was the same that everyone else would have when presented with it, which is the last thing the retail industry needs is one more event. Um, but as they started to describe what their vision was, you realize that there really wasn't something like what they were describing and that the industry really needed it. And I think one of the keys to success is how successfully they have learned to bring together all the different parts of the ecosystem. So there were lots of events that targeted specific groups. So if you were a VP of e-commerce, there was an event for you. If you were a large traditional retailer, there was an event for you. If you worked on the supply chain, there was an event for you. Um, but the idea with Shop Talk was to bring together the you know, the venture-backed startup community, so a number of these early stage companies, along with traditional brands and retailers, along with the investors, along with the analysts, along with the agencies. So really getting all of these different constituencies together uh, in one place where they would stay on site for the whole time and really learn from each other. You know, and so our goal was to build this community that really didn't exist. Right. No, that's remarkable. And you know, what's interesting as a vendor, we like it because it's the only show where we really feel on par with the brands and the retailers. And a lot of the other events, even if we've dropped a couple hundred thousand dollars on a show, yeah. we're still second class citizens and nobody wants to talk to us and there's right. a back entrance for us. And <laughs> right. And we felt like that dynamic was really broken between brands and retailers and the tech companies. And that's one of the things that we you know, strove to address with Shop Talk is we made everyone on par in terms of access to the event. No one had to be relegated to the exhibit hall floor only and couldn't access the sessions, for example. And we don't do pay to play, but we do have tech companies on the agenda. So our view is that absolutely, if you're looking to understand innovation in retail and e-commerce, you can't do it just by looking at the brands and retailers because in many cases, they aren't ahead of the tech companies. It's the tech companies that are leading the charge. And so we wanted to create an event where exactly what you described, where everyone is on equal ground and we're learning from each other and no one is treated like a second-class citizen. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And this is probably the the, the reason and argument how you differentiate best compared to other events like shop.org, NIF, and so on um, that um, had been for a while in the market. And I think the, the success speaks for you. Maybe you can just share some, some key numbers because 
uh, we, we both, Kelly and I, had been um, glad to join the Shop Talk history from the yeah. beginning yep. on, but maybe guys, not everybody. Um, <laughs> you guys were so early fortunate. supporters. Yeah. Yes, and it, uh, just seeing that growth over the last three years yep. um, uh, was impressive. Maybe you sh okay. can share some key highlights and, yep. and numbers on that. Absolutely. So our first year, we aimed to have 2,500 people, and uh, we got a lot of sort of amused smiles uh, when we told people that uh, because we were a new event, but we were very fortunate. And in our first year, we actually had 3,100 people, which we thought was quite remarkable. And we were you know, quite proud of ourselves for reaching that number. Going into year two, I think, is when things really started to accelerate. So going into that second year, we had moved from part of the space in the ARIA to all of the space in the ARIA. And we ended up in year two with 5,600 people, which again was far more than what we had originally anticipated. So going into our third year, people sort of said, well, you know, you had a good year one and two. Are you going to be able to continue to scale it? Because scaling it at 5,600 is a, you know, a pretty big number to scale from. But this year, we ended up reaching 8,400 people with a goal, initial goal of uh, 7,500. And you know, we didn't know if we were going to reach that or not, but figured we would uh, strive for it. Overperforming is always a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Underpromising and overperforming. Um, so we were thrilled by the turnout this year. And I think one of the things that I was really excited about as well is the fact that we had a much bigger international audience this year as well. Um, one of the things that, that I've been working on with the event is trying to make the content relevant to a broad audience, whether you're a US-based company or not. And so to do that, you need to bring in a lot of speakers from outside of the US. So we had over 60 speakers from outside of North America this year, You know, a large number from Europe, but also a number coming in from uh, Asia as well. Um, and then we had a session that was specific to Latin America where we had three different speakers from uh, different parts of the continent. So we really will continue with that trend to make sure that this is an event that uh, anyone who's in retail or e-commerce can benefit from. Awesome. Yeah, and you also achieved a remarkable number of female speakers, yes. right? So, which is often a challenge. Yes. Yeah. Um, but um, and, and it's often wrong presented, right? Because um, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's it's an equal uh, right. outside, but on the conferences you get a different kind of feeling often, yep. and uh, somehow you managed that to. And get it into the right direction. Yeah, and that was incredibly important to us. And I think um, you know, women have traditionally been underrepresented in a you know a wide variety of industry events. And so, you know, we keep a, a close eye on that number, the percentage of our speakers that are women. We believe there are so many women out there. It sometimes just takes a little extra effort to you know to find the speakers that you're looking for. But we did. We ended up with over 110 women on the agenda, about a third of all of our speakers, and. We were very proud of that, even though you know we would ideally like parity. Um, at least we are moving in the right direction. And how do you uh, find all of these speakers? Because you have a, a real a list of of guests here. I mean, it's a true who's who. How do you put out calls to these folks? So I'm going to take that from the perspective of sort of year one and how we built it, um, you know, and sort of how we got to the point that we're at right now. So. When we started out, both Anil and John had kind of deep roots in the venture back community. They had been venture back tech CEOs prior to starting Money 2020, so they'd worked with a number of the VCs. <clears throat> we were very fortunate to have had their support, so we worked with a number of their portfolio companies. The startups were, I won't say they were easier to confirm, but they were sort of the first round of companies that we were able to bring on board um, because we had you know, connections within that community and um, they are also, in some cases, a little less risk averse than some of the larger naturally, companies. Naturally, they need right. to present more often because exactly. to yep. attract a VC audience and exactly. so on. Exactly, and they don't have out. right, and they don't have sort of some of the corporate or PR restrictions that some of the bigger companies do. So once we started to get more of those venture back startups, and particularly some higher profile ones, I would say we started to attract some of the larger brands and retailers who were intrigued by what we were doing. And so again, we had a few people who you know, took a leap of faith when they uh, signed on with us. And we worked with a lot of people, a lot of them uh, were sort of friends of friends who were similarly interested in what we were doing and figured they would give it a shot. And then once we had a very successful year one, it became much easier and you kind of build on that. So by our third year, we had people approaching us that we would have you know, begged to, to have in our first year. So it really is a matter of just kind of you know, building on itself. 
Awesome. Maybe let's have a little recap on this year's show. Right. Yep. So we are now, um, it's just over, yes. right? Um, yeah. Half an hour ago. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. What have been your personal highlights um, when it comes yep. to, to speakers on content, on yep. maybe something that not everybody has seen, but that just you have seen on the sure. show coming up? Yeah. Um, so I think a couple things were interesting to me. Um, one is that you know, this is the first time that we've introduced a track specific to China, and we weren't sure if that would really resonate with a broader audience because we were not, you know, talking about selling cross-border into China. We were talking specifically about some of the innovation happening in China um, because that's where we thought it would be particularly interesting for our audience to learn more. So we had, you know, Alibaba and Alipay do a full session. We had you know, experts on China talking about what was happening there, and I was thrilled to see that there was enormous interest um, in kind of that perspective and learning from some of the big players. Um, another surprising thing was that Grocery Talk had such traction. Um, when we were you know, thinking about launching it, we'd never done a category-specific track before. And you know, grocery retailers don't traditionally attend the same shows that others do. And so we thought, well, maybe there'll be kind of niche content and you know, we'll work hard to get some people there. And you know, even if there are <clears throat> You know, 20 or 30 people in the room, hopefully we'll have content that's, that's relevant to them. And it was just jam-packed. We had people in the hallways on Sunday, you know, uh, trying to get in, people just trying to see into the speakers. And I think that really speaks to how much opportunity there is in grocery today, and particularly in the U.S., how untouched by digital much of the grocery uh, purchases are today, and that's going to change substantially. So I think that was another one that we were uh, pleasantly surprised to, uh, to see just so many people interested in that topic. No, that's great. Uh, you recently launched Shop Talk Ventures. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yep. Um, so we are doing it together with Commerce Ventures, which is an early stage venture capital firm uh, based in the Bay Area. And the idea is to invest a million dollars uh, over two years, excuse me, in uh, a variety of different startups in commerce technology with the, you know, the goal being to help support some of the really interesting initiatives that we're learning about at Shop Talk. Um, and it's a way for, you know, for us to, again, kind of support the community that's out there and also help bring some of these, you know, groundbreaking companies into the Shop Talk community. And you had been supporting startups from the early beginning on, right? Yep. So it was yep. um, a key part also from the first show on, it, yep. uh, exposed. So I think it's a, it's a great, great step. Um, looking at one, one other thing, last year you had um, Shop Talk Europe in yes. Copenhagen, yep. um, also a very successful event. Yes. Um, yep. Uh, what are your plans there on sure. internationalizing yep. the Shop Talk brand? Yep. Uh, what, what's coming up next? Absolutely. Um, I think some people saw us deciding not to do it this year and saying, oh, well, it wasn't a success. And in fact, it was just the opposite. It was such a success that we wanted to make sure that we came in with our second one, you know, with a really strong approach and the most modern approach we could. And this year at Shop Talk in the U.S., we tried so many different things that were, you know, brand new that we didn't know if they would work or not. We decided we really needed time to figure out which of those were going to be the most successful and were likely to work in Europe. And we, we wouldn't have been able to turn them around in a matter of a few months uh, to implement them at Shop Talk Europe. So we didn't want to risk doing a show that was already dated uh, before we even got to it. So we decided that even though it would require us to skip a year, it would make more sense to wait and do it really well going forward as opposed to doing something that you know, wasn't what we wanted it to be. No, that's uh, it's exciting. Uh, looking forward to attending. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so just final question, uh, what's next for Shop Talk? Right? So you talked about Europe, yep. talked about continuing to expand in the US. Mm -hmm. You've already gone from uh, Aria to okay. Venetian, which is now <laughs> yep. you know, the gold standard in these large conferences where yeah. AWS holds their annual conference and others. You know, are you going to get to NRF size and you have <laughs> 60,000 people or well, do you want to keep it small? Like what's your, what's your end state? <laughs> sure. Um, so we very much want to remain a conference. We don't want to be a trade show. We don't want the primary reason people come to just wander, you know, the exhibit hall. We want to have great content. We want to continue to attract a very senior level audience. Uh, with that being said, I think there are you know a, a number of areas where we will continue to grow. As I said, we want to build the international component of it. We want to make sure that we have people coming from uh, outside of the U.S., both as speakers and attendees, and that we have the content for them. 
Uh, given the success of Grocery Talk this year, I think you can expect to see more from us in that area uh, going forward. And while we continue to grow, we very much are aware of the fact that um, we want to keep a community uh, feel to it. And we want to, to be an event where people feel like they can you know, come and be a part of things. And I think that gets to be a danger if you get to be too big. So we'll have to, you know, we'll have to figure out that part. Sounds awesome, and I think it's the, from my perspective the absolutely right way to go. Everybody comes from the con for the content, yep. right? So um, though we in our other role are also here as an exhibitor, yep. um, we also want people to come for the content. <clears throat> exactly. Right? So and therefore, please keep it that that way as it is. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Keep it that exciting. Thank you so much for the time. Thank right? you. Um, Thank I you know that was coming. really a very packed week for you. Uh, just <laughs> Busy week, thinking yes. about the preparation months in, in before. Yeah, yeah. So, people always ask what else we do, and we tell them this is it. <laughs> and I think it's enough. So now, yeah, wish you a great uh, recover. From Thank you. An awesome show. <laughs> Thank and, uh, you. Hope Safe we travels. We can make another recap uh, yep. after the next year's event and see how it evolved. All right, sounds fantastic. Thank awesome. you again. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Zia.